you need to be able to put together a funding strategy. And the funding strategy consists of four things, your approach, your sources, your vehicles, and your targets. The approach is the key element where you should raise funds only after you've hit a funding inflection point. An inflection point is a measurable milestone that dramatically increases the startup's value. So if you haven't hit your funding inflection points, you might be able to raise funds, but you'll do it with suboptimal valuation and terms, and it's likely to take a lot longer. On this episode of Establishing Your Empire, I host Sam Wong. Sam is a five-time startup executive, CEO coach, advisor, and author of 21 Secrets of Successful Startups. As a serial entrepreneur, he has driven multiple acquisitions. And as a hands-on, roll-up-your-sleeves startup advisor, Sam draws from his 30-plus years of experience to train and help entrepreneurs with fundraising, strategy, product market fit, founder wellness, and a host of other areas. And in this episode, we talk about how to build a fundable startup, how to validate your idea or create your funding strategy, pitch investors, and so much more. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography, but business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right, I got Sam Wong here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. All right, Sam, I'm really excited to have you on the show today. We're going to talk a, a ton about Silicon Valley. We're, we're going to talk about startups. We're talking about funding, a, a ton of different things, but uh, and hopefully even a little bit about photography. So um, thank you so much better. for being here today. Uh, why don't we just start off and give us a little bit of overview uh, about yourself. Who is Sam Wong, right? I started off my background in corporate IT. Um, I was an engineer by trade. Then I went into nonprofit. And then after that, I went into management consulting. So I enjoyed the nonprofit because it was a labor of love. Management consulting was fabulous in that you got to work with tons of great clients, incredible coworkers, people who are very highly um, educated and people were really doing a lot of stuff with their lives. Uh, but when the family came, I decided to leave management consulting because it was too much travel. Uh, I ended up going from lots of travel to lots of hours in my first startup. So I've done five startups, all of them at the CEO, CTO, or technical VP level. Um, two of them shut down and three of them did get acquired. Uh, people want to talk about the acquisitions because, yeah, it's nice to be able to have that. But the reality is I learned more from my mistakes than the successes. So I absolutely learned, don't do it that way. You really <laughs> burn yourself if you do that. Um, and so it was definitely a, uh, a challenging exercise. So after the fifth acquisition, um, it was a company acquired by Cisco. I was able to basically leave after the golden handcuffs fell off. Cisco was a great place, but just being a big company was tough for me because I wanted to move and do things faster. Startups had tons of great opportunity and it was an awesome place to be. It's great if anybody's an entrepreneur out there, it's a great way to be able to learn if you do it with guardrails while you're driving down the road. You were doing consulting, traveling everywhere, and you wanted to change pace. How did you actually change? I think a lot of people are in the corporate world, have a, have mm -hmm. a job, have a gig that they don't probably completely love and they want to start something. How did you actually start? Uh, well, it was actually out of desperation because my wife was seven and a half, eight months pregnant. Okay, and I was still living in a corporate apartment in Denver. I absolutely needed to get home. So I just started the interview process. I wanted to go to with a smaller company. It ended up getting a job offer from a start smaller company and I was about to take it. And then the management consulting company countered and said, hey, will you please stay? We'll let you come home. And I stayed a little bit longer, but the itch had you know started and I had to scratch it. So after my son was six months old, I did end up leaving. Um, I went to a small startup company, which basically was, uh, I got connected to through a bunch of friends. 
a lot of the folks at the startup at the management consulting company I was at had already left in droves for startups and they were, you know, ringing the cash register in a lot of ways. They were growing in their career. They were um, really enjoying the ride. And I thought, okay, uh, maybe it's time to find something that's local and find something that uh, allowed me to, you know, try to, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a, an athlete who goes into the coach and says, put me in the game. Let me try. Okay. And startups definitely is like everything you, you have, they want to suck it out of you and more. <laughs> I mean, you gotta wear so many hats, but that's also a part of the fun. I think what about, so how, how did that first one go? Did it, was that a success? Was that a failure? How'd it go? Uh, in a lot of ways we built uh, a lot of great friendships, a lot of great camaraderie, but the startup did shut down. I was there for a little over a year. It was in the middle of the B2C e-commerce and it was an e-commerce company. In spite of the fact that it shut down, it was very avoidable. I didn't realize this at the time, but when everybody's packing up and putting their belongings into their boxes and uh, going out the door, somebody found the original pitch deck to uh, the VCs that funded us, the lead VC. And we said, hey, look at this. And we started thumbing through it. And I'm like, look at that, look at that. And we started looking at all the, the claims, the projections, and the expectations. It was unfortunate because the growth curve was, like most hockey sticks, up and to the right. And it just was not sustainable. Even though the company was viable, because we set such a high expectation all the investors basically were eager to get their money out. And basically what they did is say, step on the gas pedal with both feet. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the engine was redlining, you know, everything was starting to shake and rattle and it's it hitting some turbulence and we were burning through our gasoline like crazy. I think if we had a more conservative approach towards our growth, the company definitely could have survived. It was a wonderful team. It was uh, lots of great, technology, but ultimately it did shut down mostly for what I saw. I didn't know it at the time. It took me actually decades later. It shut down for very avoidable reasons. And do you think that's just because they were fearful to not be able to get funding or, or you know, why? Well, th that was a crazy time where, you know, you could have a, a really weak idea, expiredfoods.com, please invest in my company, okay? And you get millions and millions of dollars, okay? The challenge was when you raise that much money, the expectations from the investors go up. You raise a lot of money, you know, the expectations go even higher. You raise a reasonable amount and spend it reasonably, then uh, you have a chance to like, not burn through all of your uh, all, all of your reserves. So then, what what was your next? What was the next step? So okay, this is closing down. You, you obviously have a kid. So what did you do next? I was able to find another startup that was also local. Fantastic technology. I looked at the they they demoed the technology, and it was basically I'm I'm a techie, and it was application integration with inserting a single tag into an HTML file. What that basically means, before that company existed, if you wanted to have two applications talk to each other, you'd have to have you know, the developer from application number one talk to a developer from application number two. What do you want to say to each other? And then you negotiate what you want to say and you build a very tightly coupled connection. You build a hard bridge, pour the concrete between the two applications, and you've got this connection. And a huge problem if you ever want to change something and you're company A, company B is like, ah, oh, we, we can't do that. You know, yep. we can't, now we can't talk to each other. Yep, that's right. So it, it took a lot of work and it was very rigid and inflexible. Back then, there was a technology called web services, which was just starting to take off. And that's the product that we had. So we had a web services server which was basically a single click, inserting a single tag, you could make two applications talk to each other. And it was phenomenal. And from a developer's perspective, I'm like, oh my God, this is the best thing since sliced bread. And it was full of some phenomenal people. Uh, I think there were three Harvard MBAs who were at the company. There was a Stanford professor. There were just some phenomenal talent. One of the best engineering teams I've seen in, in my time. The challenge was, we didn't market it very well. We were uh, had aspirations of huge growth. And what we ended up doing was 
saying, well, we're afraid of Microsoft and some of the big boys crushing us like a bug, okay? So we purposely stayed away from uh, riding the wave of the buzz at the time, which was web services. And web services, it was the fundamental technology that underpins um, JSON integration. Um, basically, we have the same technology today. If you have, if you know of a company called Zapier, they basically implement, you know, just it's drag and drop integration between two applications. Visual, it's very very simple. A non techie mm -hmm. could do it, but we had that twenty years ago. Wow! And the challenge was because we you know, marketed it under the underneath the radar, nobody knew about us. We saw a big company bought one of our competitors for $30 million, a company called Crossgain. Well, Crossgain had no shipping product. They had a lawsuit from Microsoft because they were being accused of stealing all the Microsoft employees. And they just had a very famous um, uh, founding team that was creating a lot of buzz. A local company here in the Silicon Valley, BEA, bought Crossgain for 30 million. And we're looking it's like, oh my God, we have so much more. We had shipping product, we had paying customers, we, had ver we were on version two of the product. And unfortunately, because we mismarketed it, uh, it was challenging. And then there was a, a, a disagreement amongst the management team. The managers, a couple of managers left, okay, and a couple of key people. And the company just started to decline from there. The challenge was we had great technology, but we had not executed the marketing very well. And it was yet another example of great tech, poor marketing, well, usually doesn't win. And what do you think you would have done differently now that you that you knew that and you maybe you knew it when it was happening? Is that is it somebody that you needed to hire? Is it some you know, did you need consultants coming through? Like what do you think that you if you would go back to that time, like how do you think you would have done it differently? Yeah. So that that's an excellent question because hindsight's always twenty twenty. And it's easy to say. I don't mean to be critical of whatever else, because I was part of the team that kind of didn't know what we were doing. We were smart people, but we just weren't very experienced. Okay. Looking back in hindsight, um, definitely would have changed the marketing strategy to, uh, you know, if there's a riding wave, if there's a wave that's cresting, ride that bad boy. Okay. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, um, after some of the management uh, shuffling and such, we tried to do that. We had just a little bit more money left in the bank. And we started going down that path, started publishing articles. I wrote a couple of magazine articles. We started getting some buzz again. But uh, at the time, we had to go back out for more funding. So because a couple of the folks had left, the investors lost confidence in the team, ultimately. And they, they pulled the funding, and we ended up shutting down the company about three or four months after some of the management shuffle. So, and do you, do you feel like, hey, well, now you've done two startups, like... Were, were you, you know, excited? Were you kind of down on your luck? I mean, how, how were you feeling? And then what, what did you do next? Yeah, so it was kind of challenging because we're at this point down in the 2001 timeframe and my second kid was on the way, all right? <laughs> I basically had to figure out, okay, 40% of my tech friends were unemployed, okay? Wow. <laughs> Everybody, and we're talking about really qualified, capable people. Everybody was out there hunting for jobs because the internet bubble had burst, all right? And you know, I'm still young in my career. I was probably 33 years old, 34 years old or so. Um, so I wanted to, you know, still obviously provide for my family. I ended up doing a lot of small consulting contracts. And one thing led to another. I ended up going to uh, another firm. I took a CTO job to help build out the tech platform for a financial services compliance company. And that was great. It was a lot of fun. But what ended up happening there after uh, a little bit less than a year, I left to uh, become CEO of startup number four, which was something that I did myself. Uh, it was a uh, network services company. Uh, so that was my first uh, opportunity to be a CEO, the main guy, the buck stops with you, uh, and all the mistakes are your fault. <laughs> and, and then this one, you actually did you actually find, found this company too? Yes. Yes. So, so to talk us through that process, I think, you know, it's kind of similar to my question earlier. And I always love asking this because I think, especially I'm in here in Austin, Texas, you know, you know, you're in California, there's so many startups and you, mm -hmm. there's so many people that would love to get more involved, do their own thing. 
but you know, they just need that push to go off the cliff or right. validation of their idea or whatever. They don't know where to go. They don't know how to start. So, so t- tell us about that process, what, what you did back then, or even just some advice you have for somebody that would want to start. Right. Right. So at the time, even though this would have been my fourth startup, the startup number three was still ongoing, hadn't had an exit yet. It did eventually did exit. Okay. But I did not really know how to do a startup. It's not typically a class, at least certainly in the early 2000 timeframe. They don't teach that in college. All right. They don't teach that in MBA school either. Certainly not at the time. In fact, uh, it's only an emerging subdiscipline of most business schools. So you had to kind of learn it as you go. All right. So I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew, okay, here's a problem that I saw build the solution to try to fix that problem, go talk to customers and hopefully they'll buy it. (laughs) And it was just a lot of hard work. So I don't know at the time if I really was very well prepared. So today, basically what I do is I, uh, after having done the five startups and now 22 years into the startup thing, I actually am trying to create content to help founders, potential entrepreneurs really do it the right way. I'm trying to create content that I wish I had during, you know, all these, you know, fumbles, bumbles, foils, you know, tumbles, etc. It it was just uh, stuff that I I wish I would had somebody to guide me on it. So in, in essence, one of the things that I do in uh, one of my startup roadmap classes, one of the first things I talk about is founder readiness. Okay, and it's something that most people don't talk about. Because in, in, in going through that process, the f- sad truth is that most f- startups fail, okay? Mm-hmm. And even if it doesn't fail, are you able to put in the pint of blood and pound of flesh necessary to you know, see it through? And it's not just your decision alone. I was married. I had kids. It was a family decision. Any hour I spent beyond the normal work hours, which... You know, 40 hours startups, probably more like 60, 70 hour mm-hmm. weeks sometimes. Uh, any hour that you spent in addition to what a normal nine to five job might be is something you take away from the family. So it, that's why I, I really do spend a lot of time talking about founder readiness, the fact that it's a family decision. You have to talk about it with your spouse, significant other. You have to figure out ways to connect with your kids because it'd be the worst thing in the world to be successful in the startup and to be estranged from your wife and kids. Okay. So there's a lot of founder readiness issues about, you know, are you financially set up? Do you have a support system? One of the things that uh, I I love doing sports analogies. Okay. (laughs) Big Golden State Warriors fan. In every sports team, there's a trainer. Every athlete will get a little nick, an injury, a bump, a bruise, or in some cases, a more serious injury. Okay. When they go through that, the trainer gives them a rehabilitation program. Maybe they don't play for a couple of games while they're trying to rehab. That doesn't happen in the startup space. You'll go through a lot of bumps and bruises, and they may not be physical, but they certainly are mental, emotional, spiritual, whatever. Okay. What I found was that having a support system was key to the founder readiness so you can certainly go at, uh, go at it alone. Don't talk to your wife. Don't talk to you. Uh, don't see your kids for a couple of years. I wouldn't recommend that. You know, it, we all need a support system. I, f- I found that over the years, it, success is more enjoyable when you have people to celebrate it with it together. Okay. It's the lonely, successful billionaire or whatever. That's not a life I want to live. I completely agree. So let's say that you kind of prepped yourself. You say, okay, I think I'm ready. You know, you know, you've kind of answered a lot of those questions. What's kind of another thing that you can either prepare yourself for or to get you going? Like how do you know, say you have an idea and you really want to get going, but you don't really, you're kind of lost. What what, what would be kind of the next thing to to go? Yeah. You know, so maybe I can take a step back and talk about the process. Um, I actually, looked for the the same type answers to the same types of questions okay and when you do a when i did a google search on startup roadmap there are some things that showed up and stuff but i looked at it and some of it was just kind of a little i'd say a little thin on the content 
for example, one of the things that I found on the startup roadmap was step one, do this step, step one, do a company, step two, build your product, step three, find a thousand users, step four, go viral. I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's almost like saying, uh, step one, cure cancer, step two, uh, sell it to the world, step three, uh, retire. Right. Okay. I, I wish it was that easy. Okay. So it's because I didn't find anything that I really was happy with. I ended up doing tons of research and creating my own roadmap, which ended up being two documents. There's a high level roadmap because there's certain people who just want high level concepts. And it's about ideas about the, you know, the visual uh, journey ahead. And, but then eventually you have to find a way to implement that roadmap. So I also paired it with a low level blueprint, which is more of a reference document for people who actually have to build it. I, I often make the analogy that building a startup company is like building a skyscraper. You would find no construction company in the world who builds a building without plans. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I tried to create the blueprint in the process for how any startup or any entrepreneur should go through the process from formation to idea validation, model validation, and uh, the, the entire whole nine yards. And, and let's just dive into a couple of those. Just, I, I don't want to get like too deep, but like, mm -hmm. um, what what would be some advice on some of the idea validations or, or you know, because I, I to me I think if you want to start a startup, one of the things is is it's just to start to talk to people about it, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and get get some feedback. You know, is that some some of the things that you're talking about, or and maybe just elaborate mm -hmm. a little bit. Right. That That is the uh, definitive process. The people who are the academic researchers, they're the ones who've gone through, done the research and validated the fact that the most successful startups, they start off by validating their idea. How do you do that? Uh, there's lots of different ways to be able to do that. A good part of it is, in my mind, trying to do it at the minimal cost possible because most startups don't have the luxury of having a quarter million dollars in the bank to begin with. Okay. So you have to figure out ways to validate your idea, either through user surveys, through uh, some type of uh, focus group, et cetera. But you have to talk to a lot of people. And I had to learn that there was a structured way to do it, okay? Um, it doesn't do a whole lot of good for you to build a survey, kind of throw something together, and then send it to your network of friends for the most part, because that network of friends is probably not in your target audience. And that network of friends will probably not tell you the truth. Like this idea sucks, but I don't want to even say it to his face. I'm going to call his baby ugly. You're right. Okay? <laughs> so they'll, they'll probably end up trying to tell you what you want to hear. And it's probably not going to be enough feedback to really get an honest assessment of, is this really going to fly? After you do the idea validation, it's also important to do the model validation to assess if people would pay a sustainable rate to help you, you know, to, to buy your solution that allows you to run the company. Okay. So there's lots of techniques and processes to, to be able to do a lot of the surveying. Uh, various people have certain um, uh, techniques out there. One of them is, for example, like a wow factor score, which is a structured interview survey process. There's a certain way to even ask a question. I did not realize the way you ask a question might bias the answer. Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. so there was an art and a science to uh, doing the questioning and the survey. There's a process to figuring out how to approach and identify your customers. Hopefully, you have some contacts in your target customer base already. And hopefully, what you're doing is you're starting with understanding their problem before you figure out an engineered solution. Most people come up with a great idea. I think I have a solution. And then they end up having a solution in search of a customer with a problem. Okay. Identify your target customers. Figure out what their key problems are. And maybe it's, maybe your target customer are sales teams in an uh, enterprise sales team. So there, you figure out something that salesforce.com or whatever other solution doesn't do. So you identify and find as many sales managers, salespeople, um, sales executives as you can, and talk to them, ask them a bunch of questions about the nature of that problem. 
figure out every facet and dimension that you can, distill it back and then refine your survey. And if you can get other people saying, yes, 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 I have, I surveyed 52 people and 47 of them said, this is a big deal. Okay. If you get numbers and metrics like that, and if you uh, get certain factors like, okay, what is the maximum amount of money that you would pay to be able to do this? And those, that, those numbers start coming back like, hmm, that helps you suggest what the price point might be, the sustainable price in the market. Then you can just start building your models. How long does it take to be able to build this and sell it? And uh, what's the, the, the size of the customer base? You start projecting out a, a financial projection that says, hey, there's something to this. And then you can start investing more serious cash, time, and effort. And how often do you think people actually go through that process before they start spending money and time and effort on a startup? I think it's fairly rare. Number one, because most people don't know about it. Number two, those who do know, it's very hard to be disciplined. Uh, As I've gotten older, I'm in my mid-50s, I have a hard time with keeping my weight under control. Okay, I know the pro- general process to uh, uh, keeping my weight down is eat right, don't eat too much, and exercise. <laughs> okay, pretty simple. Um, yeah, it's it's not necessarily something that I don't know. It's the discipline to do it. It's too easy to take a shortcut. Like, oh, I had a hard day. Boy, that chocolate cake was good. I know I already had one slice, but man, there's another slice sitting there. You know, I think sometimes it takes uh, a little bit. Yeah, some people might have more self discipline than I do. Great. You're probably, uh, you know, a few steps ahead of me. But, you know, I, I found that it helps when I'm actually, for example, if I have a workout buddy, when I send an appointment, I'll actually show up and I won't cancel. I won't cancel my, my, my workout if I send an appointment with, with a friend. And if I, I'm a cyclist, if that guy is riding and he's getting tired, well, I'm getting tired. He's not, he's been in better shape than I am. So he's not slowing down. I can't slow down. I got to keep up with them. So having someone there to pace you, I think matters and helps a ton. Absolutely. And I, you know, surveys aren't exciting. Whereas, you know, starting a venture, you know, just going is a lot more exciting, but I think it's, yeah. it could save a lot of heartaches up front. Okay. Let, let's say that you did the surveys. Things are coming back real exciting. You're ready to rock and roll. What, what's one of those next things that a, that, that a founder or a future founder should do? Part of the planning process of building out your, your startup is, is just doing that. To me, planning matters. And one of the, uh, it's, it's been a generally accepted principle for decades that building a business plan for your company is important. Back in the 1980s, the business plans were 100 pages long. Today, the business plans, no, nobody does that in a startup environment. The business plans are one page. It starts off... Um, the, the trend towards a one-page business plan was created by uh, Alexander Osterwalder. Uh, he wrote a book called Business Model Generation. And in that book, he proposed a one-page business plan called a business model canvas. The business model canvas was adopted by Ash Maria in his book, Running Lean. Ash Maria made some modifications to it so that it better fit a startup environment. And I think his modifications really uh, are very, very appropriate. There are lots of variants on this lean canvas, business model canvas idea. But putting together a business plan, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, It can take just a couple hours to a couple days. But having the discipline to do the lean canvas will help you assess how to be able to uh, build up the company. There's also a matter of discipline of doing a financial projection, even if it's early on. And then once you've gotten all this together and it looks like it's not just there's a market opportunity, but there's an opportunity for you that you want to pursue and you've done the founder readiness stuff, then go for it. Hopefully you have a team, you have several other people, you know, one or two others who are helping you with the company and you start the formation process to launch your startup. And then what do you think? Do you try to go get funding right away? Do you wait and get some milestones? Like what, what advice do you have there? Because I think a lot of people don't, it's another kind of black, you know, kind of black box area. They don't know what to do or how to do it, or they're afraid they're going to go, you know, do it wrongly, you know? So what, mm-hmm. what's some advice there? Yeah, so there is definitely a way to be able to do that. And the danger is falling into the trap of doing what you enjoy. I do that all the time. I enjoy building code. I, as an old engineer, I enjoy tinkering and you know putting stuff together. 
uh, people who like to sell, maybe they like to tell their story and they just want to tell everybody about their cool idea. And then you have other folks who have been told, yeah, they're looking at their bank account and they know they need to get some money in there. So they're just immediately dive into the fundraising. Okay. Diving into these things without a, a clear plan is somewhat problematic. The most challenging thing is that uh, most startup founders have never fundraised before. Maybe they're an engineer, so they know how to build, you know, write code or build a product. Maybe they're you know, a, uh, a sales specialist or a biz dev person or marketing person, so they can do that. So they, they at least got some basics that are covered, but they kind of start learning wherever they can, trying to figure out how to fundraise. Um, and they handle it in a very tactical manner. When people find out I'm a startup CEO coach, they almost always, 95% of the time, want to tell me, want to show me their pitch, want me to help them fundraise. And uh, my response is typically, uh, that's great, but before you start to fundraise, figure build a fundable company, okay? Part of building a fundable company is figuring out a funding strategy, okay? Don't just raise money from your rich uncle. Don't just uh, start trying to cold call, you know, blind email all these investors that you uh, heard of, etc. You need to be able to put together a funding strategy. And the funding strategy consists of four things, your approach, your sources, your vehicles, and your targets, okay? The approach is the key element where you should raise funds only after you've hit a funding inflection point. An inflection point is a measurable milestone that that dramatically increases the startup's value. Okay, so if you haven't hit your funding inflection points, you might be able to raise funds, but you'll do it with suboptimal valuation and terms, and it's likely to take a lot longer. I saw a Quora a Quora post the other day where somebody wrote. I've spent 10,000 hours trying to raise funds for my startup and I haven't succeeded yet. What would you recommend I do? And I just looked at that and said, wow, that's a lot of time and effort. You should have built a fundable company first. That's probably, the, I, I don't know anything about the person. Company. Sounds like that sounds like to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. No doubt. Um, but that's a lot of time, energy and effort. And I just hate seeing people, uh, bang their head against the wall thinking they're going to crack a hole in it. Okay. Mm -hmm. They'll crack a hole in their head before they crack a hole in the wall. Okay. <laughs> so, I think it's another one of those areas where it's just exciting to say that you're funded. Uh, you want that big oh, post yeah. on the internet. You, you want it to be exciting. Um, so you, so, okay. I think you've already actually, I was going to ask you, how do you attract investors? But it sounds like you've already answered that basically get a milestone that makes your, <laughs> startup more attractive. Uh, any other key pieces there? Yeah, the, the other side of it is um, learn how to tell your story to the audience. Most startup founders are thinking about, I need to sell my product to the customer, which is absolutely true. They don't realize that they have to also sell to the investor, okay? And most startup founders are not professional salespeople, okay? They're almost always engineers, marketers, maybe product managers, and not professional salespeople. Okay. So that means you, I would recommend that uh, you learn some sales skills. Okay. Before you try to sell, when you fundraise, you are selling. I don't think people realize that. They think that, oh, it's not that hard. I'll just talk about my story and stuff. I'm very enthusiastic. I'm very chatty. A good salesperson is not overly talkative. They listen more than they talk, okay? And they look for certain keys and they understand what the audience's need is. So when you're trying to fundraise, treat the investor like a customer. If you're trying to sell to the customer, you should know what that customer's needs are. You should have use some type of sales methodology. You know, maybe you, you there's lots of sales methodologies out there. You can use something like, uh, Sandler or spin selling or customer centric selling, whatever, it doesn't matter. Okay. I've got a sales training class that I've got a, basically a minimum viable sales training for founders. Okay. If you went to one of these sales programs, you probably spent $30,000 for a six month education. Most founders can't afford to do that. All right. So 
two and a half hours, take the class, learn the, the core elements. But as part of stuff like spin selling, it's, they, they talk to you about understanding the situation, the problem, Im implications or impact, and then the positive outcome. So your customer, quote unquote customer, is the investor. What is the investor's problem? What is the situation that they get in? What is the implication of what they have? And unfortunately, I've seen some, uh, some people try to sell with absolutely no knowledge of what the investor's problem is, okay? That usually means they do a horrible job at it, okay? And I've seen a lot of founders kind of bomb uh, their, their pitch. Um, one situation, I, I'm sometimes a pitch judge for certain pitch events. There's a, a pitch uh, organization called Pitch Force. So every week they do um, uh, pitch events. I think I'll be a judge on Thursday of this week for, for that session. But basically, we had a founder show up for that event and pitch us about an interesting product. And I actually thought it was a really good idea. I thought it was a really viable product. And I was quite tempted to try to uh, um, have follow-on conversations. Unfortunately, this founder uh, made it apparent that he didn't listen, okay, number one. And then number two, one of the other uh, pitch judges say, what's in it for me? How do I make money? And the founder who was pitching looked a little upset. We'll make money when we sell a million of these. <laughs> and the, the, the point was, I'm just sitting there shaking my head. That's how you make money as a founder. How does the investor make money? Well, when I make money, you make money. No, the investor makes money either by having some type of dividend, revenue share, profit share. Most startup investors don't want that. The startup investor wants to get stock, wants to see you grow the company, and then see the company acquired by you know, bigcompany.com, okay? So that particular founder did not articulate any of that. He wanted full control of the company. He was selling a small sliver of a percentage uh, of stock, which is not how the typical startup investor invests. And even if the company was successful in selling tons of their boxes, there was no direct connection to how the, the investor makes money, okay? So that, that was a clear situation where that particular founder did not know what his customer's needs were and was selling something that did not meet that need. And therefore that founder did not walk away with a check. That's interesting. Cause you, not only as a founder, do you have to get actual customers, but you also have to have a separate almost customer as in as somebody that's going to fund the company yeah, in a different pitch absolutely. and a different story. I, I do want to change gears real quick. Um, so you wrote a book, 21 secrets of successful startups, right? Before we talked about the book, I actually want to go into how you actually wrote a book. Like, oh, did God. you have any processes? Did you have any, you know, any any tips, tricks, anything that helps? I'm in the process of writing a book. I'm, you know, kind of getting in the weeds with it, starting to slow down, a lot less exciting now that I've been yeah. doing it for a while. Yeah. So I, I want to know more about that side of it first. I did not start off trying to write a book. Um, I was basically blogging. Uh, as a cathartic exercise, having done so, you know, five startups, you know, two of them that failed, having been through lots of situations where, like I said, you, you just go through the meat grinder. So I'm just like, write it down. Hopefully it helps other people. And I had a number of blog articles and then I left um, the Cisco the company that acquired startup number five. And I thought, well, okay, I'm trying to get some visibility. Let me continue to do some of this blogging. I ran into a marketing guy. He said, oh, you do a lot of blogs. And he looked at some of the blogs. And said, hey, this is pretty good stuff. Why don't you create a book? I'm like, why don't I create a book? I, it's a lot of work. That's why not. And he said, but it gives you authority. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you should, uh, if you can do it the right way, people will recognize that you actually know something. Okay. Like, uh, okay. Well, he pointed me down the path. I started retrofitting some of my blogging and then I put together the book outline. I'm like, hmm, okay, my blog stuff only does maybe 40%. I got to write another 60%. Um, and as a perfectionist, one thing led to another. The, the guy who, the marketing guy said, just make it 100 pages. That's all you need. Okay, just 100 pages. Doesn't need a big book. Uh, it ended up being just under 200 pages. Um, it took a lot of time, energy, and effort. Thankfully, I had the ability basically to hide in a cave and write. 
sometimes you don't feel like writing. You push through. Other times you're like, oh, I'm going to drive to the beach and kind of <laughs> sit on the beach for half a day and then come back and write some more. But it took about six months and it, it, it helped. I mean, it certainly, besides being a cathartic exercise, the thing that uh, was surprising to me, the vast majority of the people who did come back and comment on the book, in fact, almost 100%, or the folks who talked more about the founder wellness portion of the book rather than the execution, the fundraising, the people. I thought that's what people would care about. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. But the vast majority of the people came back and commented about it. What said, hey, the life, the peak performance issues, the wellness, um, taking care of your family, et cetera. That's what matters. Like, wow, cool. That's very interesting because you wouldn't you wouldn't think because that, you know, but I think so few people talk about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, because you, it's just not as exciting like what I was saying with other stuff. Right. It's just not near as exciting, but it is so important because you this might be a 10, 20 year journey and you might as well be ready for it. Right. Right. Um, any other like rituals when you write a book? So it sounds, you know, for, for you, it sounded like you just threw some time at it. But was there anything else that was helpful, you know, maybe when you got the structure down or any, any other just things that kind of broke through to actually get the uh, across the finish line of finishing the uh, uh, being an author? Uh, a lot of support from my friends and my wife. <laughs> OK, because <laughs> um, there's a lot of late nights writing and such. Um, and I, I'd say it really kind of came down to. Um, coming up with a plan, trying to execute that plan. When you run out of gas, recharge a little bit with, you know, um, with, uh, with whatever meets that need for you. And for me, a good part of it was just lots of encouragement from my family and my friends. That's great. And then what about like, I, I love to ask this question of, think about your, you know, 16 year old high school self. Like what, what oh, advice would you give yourself back, back then? Don't do everything I was doing. <laughs> 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 true story i ran into one of my high school friends at a startup event uh, that i was speaking at and i saw him and then i momentarily froze he knows all my <laughs> dirty laundry it's like he knows how big of a nerd i was i worked very hard to try to uh you know forget those days in the past um and another funny story when i was dating my wife uh, i had this brilliant idea which actually ended up being a flop I said, oh, let's look at each other's yearbooks. And I brought my high school yearbook. And then she started thumbing through it. thought, oh, my God. She had chess club, math club, all this stuff. And it's like, oh, my God, you're a nerd. And she <laughs> gasped. I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> I blew my cover. <laughs> OK, I've been made. <laughs> That's great. Um, but things I would look back, gosh, honestly, I, I think I kind of grew up very dysfunctional. My motivation was to get applause, okay, mm -hmm. and whether it was trying to show off in athletics or, you know, and I'm small, so I didn't have any athletic ability. So when you have somebody who has no athletic ability trying to show off, you just laugh. It's comical, okay? <laughs> the one thing I could do was academics. Nobody wants to, ooh, look, that guy's the nerd. Let me go date that guy. I had all sorts of insecurity, all sorts of poor motives of just pursuing stuff that ultimately didn't matter. Uh, thankfully, over the years, with lots of help from uh, a ton of friends and um, uh, honestly from my faith as well, I started, I never thought I'd do this. I started going to a church, um, but that's another story altogether. I learned that there are things that are much more important than a trophy, uh, a startup exit. I've got a plaque on the wall from, you know, I guess that's startup number four that was acquired. Um, and when there's an acquisition or an IPO, the investment banker, whoever gives you a tombstone, which is, you know, the, the nice thing it says X company was acquired by Y company. You know, we served as the advisor in this transaction. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. It's nice to have it, but I'd rather have my friends. Because the, it, I'll be honest, the startup number four teetered on the brink of failure multiple times. It was not easy. Uh, there, were, We actually, if I look back at startup number four, we had almost half a million dollars in uncollectible um, invoices. So we had one customer that owed us 200000 no disputes whatsoever. Okay. 
they just were growing too fast. They changed accounting systems, lost their invoice, and they didn't pay us for six months. My wife was the bill collector. Okay. Um, so she finally got in touch with someone who was sympathetic and she did the sob story. We're a small company. We really need that. <laughs> <laughs> and they finally pushed it through. Three weeks later, we got a check. But then there was also another situation where we implemented a system and there was a bug in the system. Not our fault. The bug was with a third party piece of hardware. And we were the ones who recommended it. And the customer's network was going down as a result. So the entire company was like uh, unable to connect. And I'm like, oh, God. And we had a philosophy of leave no customer behind. Okay. Um, so we burned through tons of hours. We had $70,000 worth of pro services billings that we couldn't collect on. Then we had another situation where a project went sideways and the CEO of that company was a lawyer and they threatened to sue us. And because of the way I had done some of the fundraising, we actually got some money from some uh, creditors and not just from, yeah, we got non-dilutive funding from some creditors. Okay. But in order to get that, I had to personally guarantee the loans. Mm -hmm. So we were, had a $1.5 million line of credit that was at risk of getting called. And we didn't have 1.5 mil in the bank, either in the company or in my own personal bank account. And since I had to personally guarantee it, if they called that loan, if we were unable to make our commitments, I they could come and you know foreclose on my house, you know, kick my family out on the street. So I was freaking out like crazy, and um, you know it it kind of messed with my head. I was. Uh, so discouraged and unhappy and I was irritable. I was not fun to be around uh, because there's all this stress. And how'd you get out of it? Oh God. Yeah. (laughs) Um, That's where the support network came in. Remember I said bumps and bruises. This wasn't a bump and bruise. I broke my back. Okay. (laughs) Um, And I needed somebody to kind of help me to uh, get my head back on straight. And I had a wiser, gray-haired gentleman, a friend named John, who I respect a ton, and another friend named Rich. Uh, they basically looked at me and said, why are you working so hard? And I started to proceed to explain all the problems, all the stress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they said, well, so what if you? What happens if you can't uh, pay back the loan? So, well, they'll take my house. And they said, so what? <laughs> my jaw just dropped. And I'm like, what do you mean, so what? And they said, do you think your wife will still love you? I said, yeah. Do you think your kids will care whether they have to move into a smaller place into an apartment? No, not really. I th- we'll, we, as long as we feed them, clothe them, love them, etc. Um, and I started to realize that uh, the things that I thought were so important really weren't that important. Sure, we still had to take care of this looming potential lawsuit, and we ended up averting the lawsuit. We solved the customer's problem with like, a, you know, superhuman effort. And the company ended up, I guess, being successful. It got acquired. But man, there were many, many months. We're not talking days. We're talking months where either I didn't take a paycheck or, you know, I'm sitting here thinking I got to pump more money into the uh, to the company to make payroll. There are all these things that, you know, again, this is why I say founder readiness, founder wellness, founder peak performance, um, the, you know, the, the support network, and making sure... I had my own goals on right. So, sorry for the long-winded answer. No, I, I absolutely love it. Thank you for sharing. Um, what about what's the what's the next five years? What, what what's in store for you? Well, um, I enjoy what I do a ton. Okay, it's partially a way of giving back. Um, I'm not trying to you know. Some people say I'm doing my sixth startup. I don't consider what I'm doing a startup. I'm really more of a a coach. It's not a startup company really. Um, And what I'm trying to do is take the benefit of my scars, my bumps and bruises, all the mistakes I made, and help people to avoid the same mistakes, okay? Um, There's lots of people out there who are in the startup industry helping startups. Some of them are wildly more successful than I've been. I mean, um, our biggest acquisition was 125 million. Uh, Some people like, <laughs> that's what they do. You know, you know uh, that's chump change. They spend that on dinner. <laughs> um, well, that was not chump change for me. Um, and I, I was not a founder of that company, um, but I still did fine. Okay. The, the point is that having looked back at all these things, 
it's not just about who's been successful that I look for feedback from. I value people telling me their mistakes. Okay. I value people saying, uh, well, I tried it this way and it didn't really work out, or I wish I had done this differently. The finding people who've both succeeded and failed is key, especially people who've succeeded over a long period of time. So as I look forward, I'm trying to take my time to build reusable content. There's so many founders and startups out there, I can't help them all one-on-one. -on -one. What I'm trying to do is build scalable content, put that knowledge into re recorded training. Um, I don't charge a whole lot for it because it takes me 100 hours to do one hour of training. And effectively, if you look at my pricing on my website, I charge like 30 bucks an hour, okay? Uh, that's somewhere around there, um, depending on uh, which package they, uh, people invest in or purchase. I don't charge a lot for it, okay? But it, it's something that allows me to capture the collective wisdom so that my hindsight can hopefully be someone's foresight, that I can steer people around a, a, a pothole, you know, so that they car, their car doesn't end up in a ditch. Also, I, I want to just because we before we got on, we talked about photography and such. What what does <laughs> photography mean to you? Like, what you know, why do you do it? How do you do it? It's, I read that you actually uh, teach some photography, too. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Photography for me was a way of capturing memories. I guess I tend to be a little bit sentimental. Uh, my family grew up poor. Uh, so back in the day, taking pictures cost a lot of money. You had to take a roll of film, develop it is five, 10, $15, whatever. And if you had no skill, a roll of 24 or 36 uh, film roll, you might get one or two good pictures. We yeah. had no skill. So basically not only did we take few pictures, we didn't have any, the pictures that we did take weren't very good. Um, after startup number five, um, I really wanted to do the photography thing because I didn't have very many good pictures of me growing up, but I didn't want my kids to go through the same thing. I bought a nice camera system. You know, I, I'm up to six cameras. No, five. I sold one, got rid of one. <laughs> five cameras now. You, and, Canon, Sony, Nikon. Uh, it's all, uh, well, three Nikons and two uh, Panasonic Lumix. Oh, there you uh, go. Micro Four Thirds, because that's what allows uh, that. Cam I can get that camera and the lens in to a Golden State Warriors game. Okay. Mm. The smaller they, they the, the Golden State Warriors have a rule: three inch lenses. So the smaller camera has smaller lenses, and I can get it in. All right. So I take photos because I want to capture memories for myself and my family. Uh, some of the stuff in the back is some of the travel. So, um, and then I take it for fun. For, for I love sports photography because action photography, because it's people straining to do their best to win a game and the reactions of victory, the challenge of defeat. I love capturing that. I want my kids to have memories. So I volunteer a lot with their school, shoot the school plays, shoot the school athletic events, um, you know, shoot the various, you know, church events and, uh, uh, and things like that. And I did also volunteer. I, I uh, since I had the resources, I bought, 10 DSLRs, okay, pro DSLRs, and I went to, I was volunteering teaching, and I wanted the kids I taught to learn with a pro camera, okay? <laughs> and it was challenging. It was middle school class. I had no idea how hard it would be, but ultimately, I'm glad I did it. Um, the kids really want, they were like, can I take this camera home? Can I really work with it? A couple of kids really dived into it, and they were starting to produce some pretty good work, and they were starting to learn how to use the camera. Uh, so I see you've got the photography. Uh, we were talking about that earlier, the stories behind each of your photos. That's uh, awesome. You know, your photography for me, it was a golden ticket, you know, and I got into it a little bit before 2008, 2009, I started like a, a production company and that's when DSLR just started. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't that many people and it just, it was my golden ticket. I, I got into a lot of places I shouldn't have got into, was hung out with people that were, you know, famous and, and interesting and different and creative. And it was just a world I wanted to be a part of. And it was my way to be to give back to it too. And a lot of times right. I charged, but you know that was never a, a you're not charging the level amount of work that you're putting into it. But it was more just yeah. so I could be a part of it. And I right. still do it for that. Now, now we have a production company, so we could do like commercial services and such. Yeah, uh, a lot yeah. of marketing and all that. But that's a whole different thing than uh, if, if you're watching on video. You'll see I, I got a couple uh, photos behind me, and um, and like you say, it's memories, and it's so fun. Yeah. 
that we're able to carry these things around with us in, in your phone and everything else. It just, uh, it's a very exciting yeah. time. A friend of mine shared with me a secret to making a lot of money with photography. And I said, okay, tell me, because what is that secret? He said, start with a lot of money. <laughs> As I said, I was going to say sell your stuff, but yes, that, that, that works too. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. Because, you know, honestly, it's, it's tough to, uh, you know, make a living as a photographer as people start to devalue the, the skill, the art, et cetera. Um, yeah. It's tough, but it's an, uh, it, so what I would count, counter with that is if you can visually storytell, it's a powerful yes. way. So you, yeah. maybe you're not going to make money charging you know, an artist to take their photo. But if you can tell the story for your startup, your business, your brand, whatever it might be right. for just yourself, I, I think that's where the the new value is coming out of. Yes. I, I, I'm f fully on board. Uh, the storytelling is absolutely key. That That's that's the essence of history is stories. Okay. I, I haven't done one in a couple of years, but I used to do two to three photo books every year. Some of the stories were about my family or a vacation. Um, some of the slideshows I did when I volunteered at some school events, I'd put together some slideshows of, you know, maybe the track, um, season where you see the individual students struggling They're Okay. They're, 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 they're just trying to lean forward and break that tape before the, you know, the guy from the other school kind of beats them and stuff. And, uh, it, it's just fantastic to be able to see the, the human experience. Yeah, and that moment of time that, you know, that's, and that's the difference. I, and I love video too, but the moment in time is what's cool about photography. So uh, just a few last questions. Like what, so you've done a lot of cool stuff, you know, do you feel like you're successful? And if not, what does success look like for you? I'll be honest. Uh, sometimes I feel successful. Sometimes I don't. Um, the reality is that I, I have to admit, uh, life's been good to me. I've had tons of people help me reach the success that I've achieved. Sometimes, uh, again, this is the where the, the unflattering green eye of envy comes up and says, hey, that guy's got a new car. My car is like not as good as his. And you start to compare trying to keep up with the Joneses and stuff. And that just is, can be toxic because there's always going to be some guy who flaunts it more, et cetera, or whether they flaunt it or not. You know, there's always going to be somebody who, you know, who's uh, bigger, faster, better, whatever. I think the thing I've had to learn, I grew up uh, in a low income family. So a lot of the success was based on uh, worldly measures of, you know, size of your bank account, car, house, trophy, family, et cetera, those things. I think I've learned over the years to value things differently. Um, I remember having a conversation with somebody who said, hey, do a Google search on deathbed regrets. You're like, oh, that sounds depressing. But it's only depressing if you're on your deathbed when you do it. <laughs> if you can do it before and do something about it, live a richer life. I think that matters a ton. Which So I'm, I think I'm learning. I'm trying to pull myself out of the daily grind of the work and make sure, yeah, the work is great. Yes, I want to build a successful startup. Yes, it's awesome to get your startup acquired or it's awesome to help someone else get their startup acquired. But ultimately... Success should be measured more than just, certainly more than just the bank account thing uh, or how many of those tombstones you have on your wall. I think it, it's living a good life and um, having people who care about you and you care about in return. This is my final question. I end every podcast with this question is, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, wow. There's a side of me, again, that is kind of vain, and I, I want people to applaud uh, achievements and accomplishments. But what I really want to be remembered by is that I took care of my family, the people I loved, and uh, that people respected. I don't think people care that much about, um, oh, he was a grand poobah of company X and a, you know, a president of company Y or whatever else. Um, I don't think that really matters. Uh, I, I want to be remembered that uh, I did some good for friends and family and for people I didn't know because uh, this world is hard. There's a lot of challenges. And, you know, if we could uh, make it better, I think the, the, that's what the world needs. 
Well, Sam, thank you so much for being on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. It was a great pleasure to have you on the show. I think we covered some amazing stuff, and uh, I, I thank you for your time. Yeah, I certainly enjoyed it and uh, would love to talk about some of those photos behind you <laughs> at some point. For sure. All right, man. Cheers. Great. Awesome.